Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome. Uh, for some of you, it's probably your first time in our new headquarters here. Uh, we're delighted with this space and hope you enjoy it too and come back frequently. A special treat to see Joe and Alma in the front row. Special thanks to you for sponsoring this series. Uh, also a special welcome. I understand we have a number of students here from Washington Latin School. Uh, we're thrilled uh, to have you here. And actually, I, I was just talking with our very distinguished guest uh, backstage, if you will, and mentioned that we would have a lot of high school students here today. And it, it made me realize that unlike looking around the room, most of the people in this room <coughs> who, who grew up watching this gentleman on the evening news uh, <laughs> almost every, every night, uh, that you didn't have that experience. And this was back in the day. They were of lucky. <laughs> <laughs> this was back in the day, of course, where no one really, except maybe in Russia, understood any concept like fake news. Instead, it was quite the opposite. You had, uh, you had uh, uh, Walter Cronkite telling us every night that that's the way it is. And we assumed that that was, of course, the case. And, 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 we, and we had Marvin Kalb as uh, really one of the most distinguished broadcasters and journalists uh, that we have. And, uh, and, and, and when I was your age and, and, and watching news, as people used to do in my time, sitting, sitting around with my family, it was a regular feature. Uh, and the, this, this wonderful book, uh, The Year I Was Peter the Great, and we will very quickly get him to, to explain why this wonderful title. Uh, was just about five years before I and many in this room started watching you on, on television. And then an extraordinary career, uh, a Moscow correspondent for CBS. Uh, he, was, he was there through so many of the pivotal events uh, in, in the 20th uh, uh, century. Uh, the U2 incident in 1960, the Berlin crisis in 1961, the Cuban Missile Crisis. Then he became the uh, chief uh, diplomatic correspondent, uh, which was the first position for any of the networks. Yeah. And then really covered just about everything, certainly uh, all aspects of the Cold War, uh, Vietnam War, uh, Middle East. And then after his active period in, in broadcasting, uh, started to write books. Now, more than two dozen very, very good books. And then he chose to write this book, really your first memoir. Mm -hmm. uh, why did you write this memoir when you did, as opposed to earlier? I mean, you've been carrying around these extraordinary <laughs> memories and must have had the best set of notebooks that anyone's ever kept. No. Why, why at this point in your career did you choose to, to write this professional memoir? Let me first, looking at it, this audience uh, recognize that there are a number of friends uh, here, and I'm very grateful that they're here. Alma Joe, thanks so much for helping set this up. Um, the answer to your question is that I did not take notes. Uh, in fact, it is one of the <laughs> negatives of my life that I allowed so many of these things to happen and not take notes and ultimately depend on memory. Um, I did, however, only once in my life keep a, uh, a kind of diary. I say a kind of because it was in no way organized. It was a bunch of small pieces of paper. If something happened during the day that I thought was particularly interesting or I had met a Russian who said something of particular interest, I would write it down. But that was the extent of the diary. What happened more than anything else is that I would sit around with the family on big holidays and tell stories. My brother, who's a little older than I, is an even better storyteller. And so we would all sit around and Bernie and I would have a kind of competition as to who could tell a better story about an event, Bernie's in Vietnam, mine in, in Moscow. And we, uh, Bernie is blessed with many, many grandkids. I have two, and the two of them are wonderful in that they like me. 
I love them. And uh, the little girl of nine came over to me a year or so ago and said, Grandpa, you tell such nice stories. Why don't you write them down? You're writing down things about all kinds of other people. Write it about yourself. And I thought she was as sweet as can be. I gave her about 15 kisses and then forgot about it. When the 12-year-old grandson approached, he was much more diplomatic about it. He said, there is a record to be kept. And that stuck in my mind, and um, I discussed it then with my brother, and he said, why not? And so I did. It's a long way of saying um, I had no intention after many, many of the books of writing about myself. That was not what I found interesting at all. What I found interesting were the people I met in the course of covering world events and covering American politics. And it was difficult for me at the very beginning of this process to write about myself. But after a while of where I figured out I was not really writing about myself, I was part of a drama taking place in the Soviet Union in 1956. It was an incredibly important year in Russian history and in world history. And at that time, I found myself at the U.S. Embassy in an extremely unimportant job. But I was there. I spoke Russian. I was not married, unattached. I could go anywhere. I was curious as can be about the Soviet Union because I had studied it in school very intensively. And Harvard had a wonderful program at the Russian Research Center at that time. And they still have it, but I don't think it's as good today as it was then. <laughs> but at that time, those of us in the program were exposed to experts who could give us insights into the politics of the Soviet Union, the personalities, the literature, the history, the art, the theater. Um, I was very excited about it, Elliot, and, and this was an opportunity for me to absorb it and then later just try to tell people about well, it. Well, we're, we're delighted that your grandchildren helped inspire this because it really is a wonderful book. And you talk about stories. Uh, you actually quote in here Don Hewitt, whom you must have known well, the creator of 60 Minutes, who <coughs> said, people love a story. And, <laughs> and this book is full of wonderful stories. It's also, as you say, uh, a firsthand uh, 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 description of what it was like to be in Russia in this Annus Mirabilis, this extraordinary yeah. year. Well, so I want to talk a little bit about some of those wonderful stories, talk about the year, and then come back to get your perspectives on issues about <coughs> Russia today. Um, but, but let's just start, and you, you mentioned, and also well, we won't go into this, the book is fascinating about your high school experience. I'm looking at the high school students here, uh, your time at City College, and of course your time at Harvard, uh, interrupted as it was. And I think we're all very glad that you did not become a professor of Russian history, <laughs> uh, but uh, you cer certainly could have. Why don't we start with this wonderful story that led to the title? And, and you talked about how you had a fairly unimportant job. I mean, you were, what, 26 years old or so. You had been a private first class in the U.S. <laughs> Army. Army. And, and here you are in the U.S. Embassy, basically, it seems, sort of as a translator. And you're assigned to be the escort with Marshal Zhukov, who's, you know, Minister of Defense, Russian war hero, uh, you know, keeper of the Russian nuclear arsenal. How, how did this happen? And then what was that like? Tell us the story and bring in uh, uh, Khrushchev. It, it's, um, it's a really cute story. It's President Obama, no doubt. <laughs> <laughs> he, his office is across I'm the on, street. I can't, whoever you are, I can't talk right now. Excuse me. Forgive me, I'm sorry. You don't think President Trump would was be not, calling you? Trump does not talk to me, I can assure you. Um, let me tell you this story. It's kind of fun. Um, on the night of July 3rd, 1956, Ambassador Charles Bolin, who was one of the finest ambassadors the U.S. had anywhere, 
Ambassador Bolling got word from the foreign ministry that Nikita Khrushchev, the leader of the Soviet Union, wanted to come and pay his respects to the United States on our July 4th holiday. And he was going to bring the entire Politburo with him. Wow, that was a big deal. And the ambassador looked around and realized that he had only three other people at the embassy who spoke Russian. The embassy was woefully understaffed. And so he looked at me. He was going to take Khrushchev, of course. The two senior political officers took uh, Mikoyan and Molotov, I believe. And then they were looking for somebody to take the Minister of Defense, Marshal Zhukov, the great hero of the Battle of Stalingrad. And he looked at me, you know, I could tell what was going on in his mind. My God, I'm stuck. But he said, Marvin, you're going to have to deal with I said, look, Mr. Ambassador, I'd be honored to do that. But remember, I was a PFC in the United <laughs> States Army. This guy's the Marshal of the Soviet Union. He said, that's it, kid. You know, you speak Russian, so that's, that's what's going to happen. Well, I read up on Marshal Zhukov. I wrote a little statement that I was going to make to him when I met him. But the most important thing was that I went to Spasso House, which is the home of the ambassador. And I met there with Tang. Tang was the Chinese-born butler who worked for the ambassador. I was positive he was in the employ of at least five other secret services, but that's a separate issue. I said, Tang, we got a big problem. I'm in charge of Marshal Zhukov tomorrow. Marshal Zhukov drinks a lot of vodka. I don't. How do we manage this? And he thought for a second, and then he said, just a minute. And he ran into the kitchen, and he came back with an oddly shaped tray. And he said, I'm going to stand tomorrow. When I walk over to you to serve the two of you, I'm going to stand like this for the marshal. Over here will be vodka. Over here is going to be water. <laughs> So when I serve you, I'll serve him this way, and then I'll turn to you, you'll know you get the water. I said, right on. So the following day, Khrushchev arrived with the entire Politburo. It was very exciting. Spasso House looked absolutely beautiful. Lovely bunting up all over the place. Hot dogs and caviar being sold and given out. It was, it was very exciting. And I met Marshal Zhukov. He was about five, five, or six both in height and width. <laughs> His chest was covered with medals. And I gulped a bit and introduced myself and told him my little speech. And then we walked off and conducted a very nice conversation about the Battle of Stalingrad. And then I got into the Battle at Poltava, which nobody in this room will know when you don't have to. but. In 1709, Peter the Great beat Sweden's Charles XII in the Great Battle of Poltava. In Russian history, that's a big deal. And I wanted him to know that I knew it so that we sort of equalized the, the conversation. And he loved that. And meantime, he was, with tongue, belting back vodka. In 40 minutes, I counted, in 40 minutes, he had eight vodkas. And the Russians say, no, it was, you know, you pick up the glass and belt it right back. I belted back eight waters. <laughs> <laughs> and then Khrushchev beckoned for us to come over to him, and the two of us walked over. And I could be wrong, but I thought that Marshal Zhukov was a bit tipsy. <laughs> And he shouted out at Khrushchev, he said, Nikita Sergeyevich, I have finally found a young American who can drink like a <laughs> Russian. <laughs> and and <laughs> Khrushchev loved that, burst into laughter. And he came over and he said, what, uh, Peter the Great? He says, that's what you are, Peter the Great. How tall are you? Um, I said, I'm six centimeters shorter than Peter the Great. I said, he was a great czar. He was taller than anybody. Khrushchev loved it. We struck up in that way um, a nice, polite, but proper conversation. 
about basketball of all things. <laughs> but he always had in mind Peter the Great. And two years later, when I went back to Moscow for CBS as the diplomat, not the uh, Moscow correspondent, uh, Khrushchev on two or three occasions gave me terrific stories, exclusive stories. Uh, because he remembered the Peter the Great episode, which I can only tell you I will never forget. It's wonderful. And, and you never told him you were drinking water. I never told <laughs> And we are drinking water up here today. So um, let's, um, there, there are so many stories, but you all have to get the book to read, read them all. We'll come back to a few of them. But let, let, let's talk about that remarkable year and, and talk about Khrushchev. Uh, he gave a, a speech at the 20th Party uh, uh, Congress uh, in February uh, that was a pivotal speech in Russian history, really European history of the century, even though no Americans knew about it for some time. Just set the stage for, for, that, for that speech. Sure. The, the speech was delivered um, in two parts. There was one part early in... Um, in February of 1956, but the big speech, a four-hour speech, was delivered on February 25th, 1956. It was called the secret speech, and it was secret in that it was for Khrushchev to deliver before a group of about 600 Communist Party officials. One must bear in mind that three years before Khrushchev delivered that speech, in 1953, in March, March 8th, Joseph Stalin, who had been the dictator of the Soviet Union for 29 years, had died. But because he was the dictator in that long period of time, everything about the Soviet Union was marked as a Stalin accomplishment. Um, even terribly negative things were twisted so that they were written about in a positive way. And young kids sang songs to the great gods, and they used the word God to define Stalin. So for most people, he, he was so much a god, people were so frightened of him and the legacy of Stalin that nobody wanted to talk about him. Because if you talked about him, you wanted to be absolutely sure you said the right thing. Khrushchev decided that the Soviet Union could not survive if it continued to live by the economic and social programs of Stalin. It had to be changed. It had to be reformed significantly. And so how do you do that? You first had to changed the public impression of Stalin. And he delivered this speech in which he said of this godlike figure that Stalin was a criminal, a murderer, a person who dealt with torture, a person who almost lost the war to Hitler in, in 1941, uh, but because of the great Russian people survived, and there's a lot of truth in that. Um, and that during the 1930s, Stalin had quite literally millions of Russians killed because he took it into his head that they were in some way or another bad people, enemies of the state. And Khrushchev took it upon himself. It was a brave action. Khrushchev's biographer, um, William Taubman has written that that speech that he delivered was, on the one hand, one of the greatest things he ever did, but also one of the most reckless things he ever did because he took on the system and he delivered this speech. And it was so devastating that afterward, we found out at the embassy, afterward, three or four weeks later, that people were seen popping nitroglycerin tablets into their mouths because they were so shocked by what they were listening to that five people died of heart attacks right on the spot. Because you got to remember that if Stalin could be attacked, so could you. 
And who is this guy Khrushchev to do all of this? The effect on the entire country, first of all, on the, on the whole communist movement throughout the world. But in the Soviet Union, the Russian people, uh, it's hard for me to describe to you the effect that it had on them because the Russian people have lived with the image of a godlike, there's a Russian word, vozhd, which means not only leader, but awesome leader. And Stalin was a vozhd in a big deal. And suddenly he was being attacked. If Stalin could be attacked by Khrushchev, then somebody could attack Khrushchev. And that meant that we had, as people, a little bit of something we'd never had before, which was freedom. It's a large word for the thought I'm injecting here. The idea that you can think for yourself, that an issue comes up, you can make the decision yourself on what to do. They'd never done that before. It was such a big deal. It was an intoxicating moment. I've used that word before. In the, to describe the effect of the Stalin speech on the ordinary Russian. So, so you were there at the time. First of all, we in the United States didn't even know about the speech for some period of time. And we even didn't the ambassador, either. Even the ambassador. Well, Elliot, didn't we didn't know it. The ambassador <laughs> learned about it three weeks later after it was delivered. In other words, for three weeks, we had no idea it had happened. It's hard to imagine. Um, three weeks later, the ambassador attended a reception at the French embassy, and an Israeli diplomat there told him that there had been this big, big speech. The ambassador didn't know anything about it. Then we began to ask questions and to go around. But, but me meanwhile, the, 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 the uh, uh, effects, the ripples, began to permeate Russian society, and there was this whiff of <coughs> possible freedom in the air, and you, and you described that. And of course, it also percolated in the rest of Eastern Europe. Yes. And, 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 and led in some direct way, really, to the revolts in Poland and Czechoslovakia, and ultimately, and most significantly, Hungary. in Hungary. Yes. Um, you know, there are borders, but borders leak. And the impact of the Khrushchev speech was so great that it, it, it slipped across, it sneaked across the borders into Eastern Europe. And people began to think in that same way that the Russian people were. If Khrushchev could attack Stalin, then they began to think in local terms. Um, can I then criticize the head of the Polish Communist Party or the Hungarian Party? And the answer that they gave themselves was, yeah. I can certainly try. And throughout Eastern Europe, there was a rumbling. And then in Hungary, in late October and then early November of 1956, there was a genuine national revolt, and principally led by young people. Young people roughly the age 17, 18, 19, 20, who were right up in the forefront of that Hungarian revolution. And Khrushchev had probably in that year the second most important decision that he had to make. How does he deal with the Hungarian revolt? Because he's responsible for that. And do you allow the consequence of your speech to flow all out and let there be a rumbling of freedom throughout all of Eastern Europe? What would happen? He realized what would happen would be the communist system in Eastern Europe would crumble. And that meant, that would be a direct, in the Russian mind, a direct national security threat to the Soviet state. And Khrushchev decided he had one of two choices. He could effectively give up his, his political position or crush it. And of course, he crushed it and kept his job which he kept until 1964. But I don't think he was, after that decision, a happy trooper. 
because he realized that he had a moment there where he could have taken the promise of 1956 and rolled it into a kind of controlled revolution that could have swept away, forgive my language, the garbage of communism uh, throughout Eastern Europe and allow some form of democracy to take place. Not an American form, but some form. He had the choice. He made, I think, the wrong call. But that's that well. It's it. remarkable, sort of, you know, how your year there. The book ends being, you know, the, the, this remarkable speech, the ripples of possible thaw, right. and then, of course, the brutal <clears throat> repression. And the students in this room went brutal. I mean, all of those seventeen, year, many of those seventeen-year-olds were killed, and the, as the Red Army marched marched into Budapest. Yeah. Um, but in between that extraordinary, and I said there were lots of stories. <clears throat> You had the opportunity to travel <coughs> in a remarkable Everywhere. way. And you said you were unattached, you could do that. And there are all kinds <laughs> of stories we could tell all afternoon. But I just want to <laughs> ask, uh, and we'll maybe come back to your impressions about, quote, ordinary Russians. But I want to ask you in particular about your trip to Kiev. Uh, and, and you had a personal reason for that trip as well. Tell us about you know, your, your mother had left Kiev, as I recall, in 1914. 14. So many, many years before you were there. And you went to the neighborhood, the Podolf, I think. Uh, Podol. Podol. Neighborhood, uh, uh, which was, had, had been a predominantly Jewish neighborhood at some point. Mm -hmm. And what was your experience there? Well, my mother uh, was born in um, 1899 in Kiev, in a region of Kiev called the Podol which was the market area of the city right alongside the river. And it was an area of primarily um, a Jewish population, but not entirely. There were Ukrainians there, Georgians there as well, but a lot of Jews lived there. And they had a lot to do with the marketplace idea. And people would come down Kiev is a city in, on, two low, on two heights. There's a height way up above where the good people lived and beautiful churches, lovely area, beautiful city. Then a sharp drop down to the river, and the Padol is down below. And my mother used to describe the Padol, and I had in mind, and it was totally unrealistic, I had in mind sort of where, the way we lived. It would be a middle-class area. And people lived, Jews of many other people lived together. And I went there hoping that that would be true. It was anything but. Um, the Jewish people lived in the Padol in unbelievable poverty. If you could imagine some of Charles Dickens' stuff and what he wrote about London in the 19th century, that's very much the Jewish existence in the Padol in Kiev in the middle of the 20th century. Um, people walking around, not with shoes, but with cloth wrapped around their feet. Uh, not real clothing at all, but sort of rags. It was pathetic, it was awful. And it was a Friday and I went down to the synagogue. There was one synagogue that the Russians left standing after World War II. And I met a young man on the walk there who uh, told me a little bit about the community. And when I got there, um, I was immediately surrounded. Uh, please understand, not for anything having to do with me personally, but that I'm six foot three, and most of the people there were five, 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 six. Uh, most of them were old, uh, very poorly dressed. They spoke um, combinations of Yiddish, Ukrainian, and Russian. I spoke Russian and Yiddish so that I was able to communicate with them. That was not a problem at all. And they began to throw questions at me. They were very excited to have a young American there. And they asked me a question, many questions. Are you married? I said, no. 
They said, what's the matter? There are no <laughs> Jewish girls there. You know, everything was, was wonderful in, in a way. And then a little man came over to me, and he reached for my jacket with two experienced fingers, felt the lapel. And he looked up at me, and he said, hmm, he says, where was this made? I said, well, I don't know where it was made. I bought it at a store called Brooks Brothers in New York City. And he said, hmm. He turned to a friend and he said, we made much better stuff than this, <laughs> but before the revolution. And then he looked at me and this, he said, you said your mother was, was what? What was her name? I said, Bella. Mm -hmm. He said, what was, her, what was her father's name? I said, Wolf. Um, uh, hmm. He said, he was a furrier? I said, yes. Uh, hmm. He said, and they left when? In 1914. He said, I knew your mother. We went to school together. And I was stunned. 42 years had passed. 42 years of wars and revolutions and the Holocaust and everything. And one little man was still there who remembered my mother. I was... Uh, Let, you know, it's a remarkable story. Um, let's stay on Ukraine for a minute. Yeah. Um, because obviously it's so important today. Mm -hmm. uh, can you help us understand why Ukraine is so important to Putin? Because if you, uh, for uh, Putin, first of all, understand, is a classic Russian nationalist. Whatever other words you want to throw into a description, those are the three key words. He is traditional, he is Russian all the way, and he's a nationalist all the way. And the three come together to present a phenomenal challenge right now to the U.S. But because of the traditional aspect of his thinking, um, certain things have to fall into place for him to understand a recreation of the greatness of Mother Russia. And first of all, territory and people. The territory must consist of Russia, Belarusia, and Ukraine because that's where the Slavic people live. And the Slavic people originated a little more than a thousand years ago in and around Kiev, and the, at that time the country was called Kievan the Rus, the Kievan part of Russia. And today, people like Putin look back upon that as the root of contemporary Russia. That route is the capital of Ukraine. And it's an older city than Moscow. And it, it is a much older city and a great city. Uh, and a city about which you can be quite proud if you live there. Um, but for a Russian nationalist, it is simply part of the greater glory of Russia. And, you know, the, the, the Russian would think about a Ukrainian as a cousin. Um, the Russian lives up in Boston and speaks with a certain dialect, and the cousin lives down in New Orleans and speaks with another dialect, but they're essentially part of the same country. And that is the Russian nationalist approach to Ukraine, and therefore the idea of Ukraine being independent on its own, all of that, is an unacceptable fact. Uh, to many Russians who think about Russia in the way in which Putin does. Now, I think some people in this room are aware we now actually have an Aspen Institute in Kiev. Mm. And, and I, I hope many of you will get a chance to, to visit. It's a remarkable place and, it's, it's, and, and we can see there this extraordinary courage, especially of the young people. And, wow. and wanting to build a, a, you know, a new and, and, and democratic Ukraine. Um, let, let's talk about a few of the other <coughs> themes, uh, because obviously this is not, this year and what you experienced have 
implications. Russian history, as you said, is a continuum. Um, you have some observations in here about the role of religion in Russia. Mm -hmm. And uh, I wonder if you could comment on those and then bring them to, to today in Russia and how Putin regards the Orthodox Church and religion. Sure. Um, I was talking a moment ago about the origin of the state being in Kiev and Rus. At that time, when that country was at its height, um, the man who led it was a man named Vladimir, it's interesting, Vladimir the Great. And Vladimir went to Crimea, I believe with 998. And he then accepted from the um, Christian world of the West, Christianity, as a religion to be imported into the East. And he pronounced himself to be a Christian. The reason he did this, by the way, had nothing to do with religion. The um, princess in the Byzantine Empire was quite a good-looking girl. <laughs> and Vladimir wanted her more than anything. But her father said, you can't have her until you become a Christian. So he said, what is that? He said, well, you know, you have to believe in Jesus Christ. He said, I'll believe in anybody, <laughs> uh, but I want her. And so he got her, became a Christian. The net effect was that he then Christianized that whole region of Ukraine, which then grew into Russia itself. And the, the idea of the religion as being a central part of the origin of the Russian state has been there from the very beginning. Putin himself walks around uh, at all times with a very large cross. He says that cross was given to him by his mother, that the cross came from the Middle East, that it has been blessed in a certain way. Um, like many good politicians, he swears he goes to church every Sunday, but he does not. I don't think he's been in church except for political occasions ever. That's irrelevant. What is relevant is the connection that a politician will make and a warm embrace of the Orthodox faith. That is essential. For the entire right wing of Russia, for hundreds of years now, there have been three aspects that are central. One is always autocracy, the strength of the voice, the leader. Two is the religion. And three is nationalism. Those three keep the country together for hundreds of years and up until today with Putin. And you mentioned a moment ago, Elliot, this term continuum. To please think about Russian history, not as a moment right now when you have Putin and you study Putin, you know Russian history. Putin is simply a continuation of a pattern that has been in existence now going way back to the time that the czars ran Russia. He is the latest czar to be in that position in the Kremlin. Well, that, that, I mean, there's so many passages in the book that are wonderful too. You just mentioning that brings to mind this one, where you say it was almost as if the Russian people required a personality cult, a leader of unquestioned authority and power to help them survive the day-to-day -day hardships of a lousy, unproductive system. Yeah, um, if you imagine an economic system, even now when there's no real communism there at all, um, it is a terrible economic system. They have tried since the end of communism in 1991 to build something new, and they have failed. And Putin knows it better than anybody. And he listens to a number of his economic advisors who lay out um, plans in a way for how long this country can continue without going into utter bankruptcy and falling apart. And they have in mind what happened to the Soviet Union in 1991. And if it could happen to the Soviet Union, it could happen to Russia. And at the core of the collapse in 91 was a terrible economic system married to a political system that simply didn't work. 
And the political system today with Putin is getting to that point also. You cannot go on as the number one guy in a country that vast. Please bear in mind, there are nine time zones in Russia, even though it has, at this point, only 148 million people, 148 million people. It used to have, before 1991, 240 million people, lost a lot of people. 140, and with this vast country, it is incredibly difficult to run a place that big, unless you are a dictator of some sort. And the Russian people will buy that. That's not their problem. If you can, you can have a dictator, an orderly dictator, who will make sure that there's enough bread, meat, a degree of freedom so your kids can go to school, uh, you can have a car, that sort of thing, but you cannot have political freedom. And that is the deal that Putin has tried to strike with the Russian people. I'll take care of your politics, and, but I'll try at the same time to help you economically. That is his deal. And they've accepted it up to this point. But I think we're reaching a time now where that's beginning to slip away from him. And he is now going for power on the mistaken assumption that he's the only one who can possibly govern. It happens to dictators. They get hooked on themselves. They all think they're so wonderful, but they're not. Let's just stay, let's bring it very contemporary for a minute before I come back to this, and then I'm going to open it up to everyone. Um, uh, the, the recent poisoning in, in Salisbury, England, uh, and, you know, all of the, the, you know, whether it's, you know, murdering people on, in other countries or hacking elections or, or, or using cyber techniques to bring down power grids. What if you were, if that were President Trump who had been on the phone at the beginning of our conversation, <laughs> what advice would you give? What is the proper response? I mean, whether it's, it's what the response of, of Britain should be, NATO should be, how should we be dealing with these provocations and acts of, of criminality? Elliot, if you had asked me that question about a week ago, I would have said that we have to be understanding, pay respect to, to Russia and to Putin, be understanding, but in a way firm and articulate our position. But I would not have put it in the context that I put it in today. I have shifted my ground considerably in the last week. I think that Putin has now gone too far. And there has to be a way for the Western world to tell him enough that you have played your game, you want to be respected, you want to be a big boy on campus. Uh, we'll play that with you. We respect you. We understand there is a Russia, and there always will be. But you can't mess around with us anymore. And we will make that very clear by doing a number of things. And I think the way in which you move on Putin so that he understands it's not military. Get that out of your mind. It's economic. For example, there is a deal now between Saudi Arabia and Russia on oil that the price of oil will not be allowed to drop below $60 a barrel. We tell our friends in Saudi Arabia to knock it off, to pull out of that deal, and let the price drop below 60. Let it go down to 50, or however the market pulls it. Because if you go below 60, and the Russians to this day must depend upon oil for their revenue to do almost anything, <clears throat> that is something he will understand because he will not then simply have the money to mess around in the Middle East. Um, 
And I think that there has to be something in a unified way that the Western world can do uh, to tell Putin that he is beginning to edge up against aspects of the West that we consider very important and that we don't like him to mess around. The idea that Russian agents can take a poison gas and go into a small British town. There's no reason why they can't do the same thing in Chevy Chase, Maryland. Um, it is unacceptable, simply unacceptable, and they have to be told that. Let me come back to, a, to a, 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 another story in your book, and then I'm going to open, open it. Um, right. And there are two stories that relate to how it is that you came to be the journalist that you have been. And there were two different outcomes. You were offered a job as a very young man by Dan Shore. Right. Uh, Dan Shore was a great CBS correspondent and was the CBS correspondent in Moscow in 1956 when I was there working at the embassy. So and first tell me why you turned him down, and then I'm going to ask the story that you know I'm going to ask. Well, Dan, <laughs> Dan offered me the opportunity of leaving the State Department and going over to be his number two man in Moscow for CBS, which was for me a dream. I loved the idea. I, I thought it was fantastic. But... I had promised my mother <laughs> that I would uh, complete my PhD, and that meant completing my dissertation. And if I joined CBS at that time with the dissertation only half done, um, I almost certainly would never have the opportunity to finish it. I would get absorbed in that, that CBS and the news. And so I explained to Dan that I could not accept that he was stunned. I was as well, frankly. Um, but I, I couldn't accept it because I couldn't, um, I couldn't explain it to my mother. So I let it go. So, 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 so then flash forward uh, to, I think, I think it was taking place in the Harvard Library. And, and uh, someone was on the phone and you didn't really want to speak to the person. Well, this was when I came back from the assignment uh, for the State Department. I went back to Harvard. I was in the library. I was finishing up the dissertation. And one morning, um, the librarian, a lovely woman, came over, patted me on the shoulder, and she said, Marvin, there's a man on the phone who would like to talk to you. Um, he says he's Edward R. Murrow. <laughs> Uh, for you guys over here, <laughs> Edward Almero was the greatest television radio reporter there was in those times. And because he was so great, I said to my friendly librarian, I said, no, no, no. Edward Almero is not calling me. Just hang up on the guy. He's probably drunk. You know, forget it. And I went back to doing my work. I thought nothing of it. She came back later in the afternoon and she said, uh, Marvin, it's that same guy. <laughs> he's on the phone and he says he's Edward R. Murrow. Don't you think you ought to talk to him? And I began to think uh, my brother had met Murrow. Uh, I had been writing, maybe Murrow read something, who knows? So I went and picked up the phone. And the minute I heard his voice, he had a very marvelous, distinctive voice. The minute I heard his voice, I realized what a total jackass I was. <laughs> and I said, please forgive me, I'm terribly. He said, no, no, no. He said, it's all right. Can you come down uh, tomorrow morning at 9 o'clock in New York and talk to me about Russia? I like the piece that you had in the paper the other day. I, I was flattered, thrilled. I said, of course, I'd be there. And I was there way before 9 o'clock, and his secretary a wonderful English woman said, now, Marvin, you've got no more than a half hour with him. Remember that. I said, absolutely. Okay. I'll take 10 minutes of his time. We spoke for three hours. And that is because Murrow was so intensely interested in everything having to do with the Soviet Union, very interested in the young people, in religion, marriage, everything. About 10 o'clock in the morning, <laughs> While we're chatting, a job was there, obviously. 
And he reached down into his desk drawer and pulled out a bottle of Johnny Walker Black Label Scotch, <laughs> put it on the table with glasses this size, two of them, and began to pour. And the look of my, on my face must have been one of absolute horror. 10 o'clock in the morning, what is? And he looked at me and he said, oh dear, he said, you don't drink. <laughs> I said, no, does that mean there's no job? <laughs> and he said, no, but it does make it that much more difficult. <laughs> but we continued chatting for another two hours, but um, he then offered me the job in a formal way and, and put his arm around me at the end and said, you're now um, in our family. And it was, for me, one of the uh, greatest moments of my life. I well, say. I think now we've, that we've come full circle from vodka to scotch. <laughs> uh, it, it's time to open up questions from our audience. And as we take these, we ask you to wait for a microphone, tell us uh, who you are, and then uh, a, a short question uh, for our wonderful guest. Yes, Joe in the front row. <coughs> Marvin, thank you for coming. Most interesting. Uh, I have my own vodka story. Uh, when I was ambassador in uh, Switzerland, we were invited by the, Ru the new Russian ambassador to the house, to the uh, residence. And we got, went there, and the first thing they did was put a bottle of vodka <laughs> on the table. We toasted Bush and uh, Khrushchev, and it was quite an experience. Uh, which leads me to the question about the uh, life expectancy in Russia, which is in the 50s, I believe, uh, which probably is due a lot to the vodka uh, situation. Uh, but I'd like to have your comments. Yeah, they have um, an unusually low, um, what's, what's the word? Uh, no, they, <clears throat> I think for men now, it's in the 50s and women maybe 61, something like that, but very low. And Joe, part of the reason is maybe too much vodka, but a more pressing reason is they have a dreadful medical system. Uh, it's extremely difficult to get medical help. Uh, medicines have to be imported. <clears throat> and if everything is dependent upon the state, the state will determine which drugs are imported. The big shots get their drugs directly from Helsinki. They have no problems. The average Russian has to somehow or another find medicine, and they can't. So a lot of people are dying for that reason. A lot of people are dying because the hospital system is atrocious, absolutely atrocious. People, <clears throat> People who are in the hospital for longer than two days cannot count on a change in sheets, uh, in, in, in clean utensils, in injections are the same needle as used by a number of different people. It is pathetic. Mm. And this is a country that prides itself on greatness and I have an enormous regard for the Russian people. I think they've put up with a lot. And Russia has produced great, wonderful cultural achievements. Russian mathematics is among the best in the world. Goes back to Lomonosov in the 18th century. They are a fine, talented people, but they live in, in, a, in a dreadful economic and political system. And we are all paying the price now for that because Putin is trying <clears throat> to do two things that are irreconcilable. He's trying to be the leader of a great country and for the entire world to believe it and to deal with him at that level. And on the other side, he knows what a mess the country is. Um, and in medicine, I'm glad you raised that because it's part of the genuine reality that Russians live by every single day. Yeah, HIV is very prevalent there too. I, I think there was a question 
Uh, yes, in the, in the second row, and then, oh no, back there, and then up to the second row. And then I want to come over in the middle of, in this side. Thomas Hagerty, Washington Latin, thank you, Mr. Calv, just amazing. Two questions. Uh, your comment about uh, Russia's view of Ukraine and how they feel about that. What do the Ukrainians feel about that relationship? Second question, uh, comparing uh, Gorbachev and Khrushchev. Uh, let me do the second one first. Gorbachev always regarded himself, still does, as a, quote, child of the 60s. What that means is a child of the Khrushchev era. And you got to remember that Gorbachev was, was in school in, in, um, at Moscow University from 1950 to 1954. Khrushchev came into power in 54. And he opened up the eyes of the Russian people in a deceptive way, in, in a way. But, but Gorbachev felt that Khrushchev represented the opening, the post-Stalin era. And they were very proud, the Gorbachev generation, to be associated with Khrushchev. Um, and Gorbachev tried very hard to move Russia forward from the, from the Khrushchev era into a new era involving more freedom. But he failed. Unfortunately, he, he went a good way, but then ultimately failed. The system itself wouldn't yield, and the people who were in power were afraid of losing power. That's that. On the Ukrainian side, it's a wonderful question for a lot of different reasons, because you will rarely find a Russian family that does not have a Ukrainian connection. Some uncle and living in the Ukraine. Likewise, Ukrainians who don't have a Russian connection. The, the Ukrainians today who live in the area of the Donbass, which is that part of Ukraine controlled by Russia, there was an odd kind of survey done not too long ago. Uh, I don't know how much value you can put on it, but for whatever value it has. Um, they asked the Ukrainian people in that area of the Donbass, would you all like to be hooked in officially with Russia? Absolutely. I think because they would have the security then of being hooked into a great power and maybe bad economic times would not be as bad if they lived under Russian authority. The Ukrainians today also have a new sense of nationhood. Not quite a raw nationalism, but nationhood. An awareness that they are a nation. And that people have to respect them as a nation, including Russia. And there are many Ukrainians, in my view, who would love to have some sensible relationship with Russia. So much of their economy is hooked in to Russia. Um, Poroshenko, who is the head of Ukraine, made all of his money, he's, he's a billionaire. He made all of his money uh, producing chocolate. <laughs> and by the way, it's very good chocolate. Most of the factories are in Russia. So even Poroshenko has this economic tie that, that he would like to have solidified. Um, I don't know if it's ever going to work out, but there's every reason to hope that some way or another, sensible leadership on both sides could reach a deal. But I wouldn't bet on it. Yes, right here, please. So uh, thank you to the Aspen Institute for hosting and Elliot for moderating. This was really, really interesting. But one of the things that I was most interested in is your reference to economic freedom and political freedom and uh, the connections between the two. And we live in an interconnected world. So over the last few days and some of the developments that have happened, I, I was really interested that you spoke about your rethinking of some of those issues. Um, 
I guess so there was solidarity, certainly, and that was, I mean, I have the good fortune to live and work in the US, but I grew up in England, and I was very um, heartened to see that solidarity. But there was a moment at which it took a little longer than I would have liked, and it gave me a little bit of concern. So given your experience and your erudition, did, you, did that give you pause? So if something were to happen in Chevy Chase, Maryland, I would want the leadership of the UK to be an informed response, but also a, a, an expedient response. And so I kind of wanted to ask you a little bit of your, your thoughts on that. <clears throat> mm. uh, thank you very much. Um, dealing with the Russians is always uh, tricky because there's a large psychological component. You're dealing with a country and a leadership that essentially as an inferiority complex, and is always measuring itself up against the rest of the world, especially the United States. Putin has a thing about the United States. And I believe it's that his recognition that he's never going to be able to succeed in his own country, unless he has some kind of a deal with the United States, um, he has been it, it has been called a Yalta II agreement. You go back to Yalta I after World War II, and now you'd have another one, which would be a large agreement involving all of Europe. And Russia would have this, and the West would be there, and everybody would understand that. In order to get there, Putin has to be persuaded. This is my judgment, and very recently. He has to be persuaded that he has pushed too far, that we are generous in giving him space, but he's now occupied his space and begun to move into ours, and it has to stop. I don't want any military conflicts, whatever. I don't want us moving tanks up to borders. I don't like any of that. I think it can be done through economic pressure, and an awareness that Russia is sort of an underprivileged country in many, many ways. Of the 148 million people who live there, there are probably a million who do very well, and there are probably two or three million who are fine, and then everybody else is up the creek. Oil provides the money. So if we can deal with oil, that is not an aggressive action. That is opening the marketplace. And I think that's where we ought to be in terms of applying a new form of pressure on Putin and make him understand. You need at this point a little bit of what I used to observe with Henry Kissinger when he was Secretary of State. You say things with just a little bit of a smile on your face so that the other guy knows you're lying. And you know you're lying. Everybody knows you're lying. But you know what you're lying about. And it has to be that kind of clarity. I don't see that in our diplomacy today <laughs> at all. So it's going to be very hard to do. But the president sees himself as a great deal maker. Let him make a deal. Uh, but, but before we come back here, I, and, and we'll come to the second row next, I just want to make sure one of the students doesn't have a question. We still have time. Um, but be thinking of one. We'd love to hear from younger, younger people. There's ah, one. great. <laughs> <coughs> Hi. <laughs> Hi. I'm Isaiah. I'm from Washington Latin Public Charter School. I'm not standing up. Um, so you talked about Vladimir the Great, and you talked about how he turned Christian for the um, Byzantine princess. Did he ever marry the Byzantine princess? Did he ever want him? Marry the Byzantine princess? Him. Absolutely. Oh, okay. That's good for him. I Christianity for a bride. Okay. That's where it works. That's not a bad trade, I guess. <laughs> 
<laughs> All right, right here, and then we're gonna come to our friends in the front two rows. <laughs> In uh, the last 30 years, there have been many, many changes economically in both uh, Russia and China. I wondered why uh, China has been so successful and Russia has been so unsuccessful. Because one is Chinese and one's Russian. <laughs> now, I don't mean to be glib on that at all. The Chinese are masterful uh, in business. Uh, uh, there is an entrepreneurial bloodstream that runs through that society. They know how to make things work. They know how to take nothing and make it something. Um, the Russians don't. The Russians have great difficulty. I mean, you make a comparison of peoples. The Germans know how to do things. The Russians know how to do certain things. But those things that have to do with living standards, normal, ways of living, they have failed. Um, they would love to learn how to do it. And ever since Peter the Great, which is the early part of the 18th century, they have been inviting foreigners in to help them do things. When Catherine the Great came along in the, the latter part of the 18th century, she invited one French and Dutch expert after another, and even went so far as inviting somebody like Voltaire, to come as a philosopher. She even, in that way, indicated that she had to import Western philosophy into Russia. They didn't have their own. And that's been the curse of that country from the very beginning. And the Chinese are simply much more self-sustaining as a people. Oh, okay, I promised question. Do you still have there a question? There are two, two hands back Yeah, and then, so. and then we'll come promise you back row if you bring the microphone, <laughs> the two right there. But no, no, that, that, go ahead. Um, Marvin, um, I want to ask a question not about Russia, but about the process of writing this book. And um, the question comes because uh, you, there have been many references made today to the students who are with us today for whom names like... Daniel Shore, Edward R. Murrow, our, our, our ancient history. What's more um, concerning, uh, I think, is the view that people who are coming of age now have about the business of journalism and about the, the media and the news media. And uh, Eliot made reference uh, in his opening remarks about how this is really your first memoir or quasi-memoir. And I'm wondering if you could describe why, uh, if go back to the question of what, what was it, in addition to beyond mm -hmm. two wonderful grandchildren, uh, that wh why was it difficult for you as a journalist to write a book like this? What is it about the journalism ethic that made it difficult for you to do this? Thank you, Gary. As a kid, your age roughly, um, I lived in a home where we simply did not have the money to buy a New York Times. So that was beyond us. But my father would come home uh, from work quite often with newspapers that he had either picked up along the way uh, or perhaps had, had bought himself, I don't know. And there was always a moment after dinner when my father, if it was a quiet night, um, would be allowed to just read his papers. And there was something rather sacred about that hour when Pop could read and leave him alone. And then he wanted to talk about what he read. So we would have conversations after that based upon what he had read in a newspaper and what his instincts were about this or that. My father, um, as many, many immigrants to this country, my father was a great patriot. He loved the United States and thought that we could do nothing wrong. 
Um, and so I was brought up with that idea that, that there's this, this positive vision of America and ideas coming from newspapers. Um, when I got to a point where I could sort of stand on my own and buy newspapers and all kinds of other things, I wanted to learn about what was going on in the world. It was extremely important to me uh, when I was in high school to be part of the high school newspaper and then in college to be part of the college newspaper. And because if you were with journalism and journalists, you were connected to the real world and you were finding out things and it was very exciting because you would be learning things that nobody else knew. And then you would be able to share it. And I've always wanted to be, in a sense, a teacher. So whether I'm a teacher at the Kennedy School or I'm a teacher in front of a camera, the difference was simply one of how you communicate, but not the idea of communicating to the public information that you thought they would find of interest. I always believed, and believe today even more passionately, that freedom of the press, the idea of people in the fourth estate, so-called, having not only the right but the absolute responsibility to look upon what is happening in the other three branches of government, the other branches, the branches of government, and speak truth to power. That cliche is essential. Somebody in this society has to have the courage to speak truth to people of power. Because people in power, if no one speaks to them, will think they're right at all times. And they could be wrong. They could be right, but they could also be wrong. And if they're wrong, somebody has to tell them. And in a democracy, the people who will tell them, in my judgment, come from two parts of our society. One is the press, a free, restless, unsatisfied press, and the judicial system, the court system. That there be some judge, some body of law, more important than an individual. If you have the law and you have the press, we will retain our democracy. If you lose one of the two, you lose both. You cannot lose one without losing the other. And if you lose one, you've lost both, and then you've lost democracy. And it's very, very difficult to explain to people who have lived in a democratic system all of their lives to appreciate what it would be like not to live in a democratic system. But I can tell you, your lives would be radically different. So if you like what you got, you think about, in my judgment, these two institutions as sacred repositories of the democratic value system. Um, did I answer? Now, thank you, Gary, for that important question. And, and, thank you. And, thank you. And, and, and wonderful, profound answer that's never been more important. I think we have some people in the back, perhaps, some young people with some questions. There were two of them back there. Yeah, two. Why don't we get both questions, and, and then we'll let uh, Marvin okay. answer both. Yeah, hi. Um, I was just wondering, yes. Oh, my name is Pascal. Hi. Nice to meet you. Um, I was just wondering, because I don't know that much about you, so I was wondering how you learned Russian. Did, was it like spoken at home? That's a very good question. Tell and me. The other, and the other not, question? You have to translate that for me. <laughs> how, you learned, how you learned Russian. Oh. How you learned Russian, whether it was spoken at home. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, um, hi. Um, I'm Rachel. Uh, my question is, after meeting Khrushchev, was your opinion on the Soviet Union changed at all? And uh... Thank you both. Let me tell you about the Russian. Um, 
When I was in graduate school, uh, in my first year of graduate school, I was learning Russian. Russian was one of my languages. I tried at that time to learn Russian and Chinese at the same time. Uh, after six weeks, I dropped Chinese because I was going out of my mind. And I stayed with Russian. And I came home for Thanksgiving. I went into the basement where I, sort of there was an office down there, and um, I was studying my Russian. And I was studying Russian by saying things out loud to myself. There was nobody there. Except, I noticed on the top step, my mother was seated at the top. And she said, if you don't mind, Marvin, I, you just said something wrong. I said, what? Mm -hmm. She said, the Russian word you just used, she said, you mispronounced it and you used it wrong. I said, wait a minute, you know Russian? <laughs> she said, oh yes. And for an instant, I was furious <laughs> because if she had spoken to me in Russian when I was young, I really could have learned that language inside out instead of having to suffer in graduate school with it. But she did not want me to grow up. This was an immigrant family's idea. You don't grow up with your children speaking with an accent. So she spoke to me only in English. So I had to suffer and learn Russian in that way. So it was, I wish it were at home, but it wasn't. It was uh, otherwise in the second Yeah, question that's was, fascinating. I mean, it's same with, I mean, my father grew up in Poland and speaking Polish and Yiddish, <laughs> but I never heard him speak a word of Polish. Of Polish you know. But he, of course, knew what was the second, the, second, the second question was about Khrushchev and how, how it affected your views of Russia. And I'm going to add a little a footnote to that question, which is it's not, it's, it's fascinating when a book so much about Khrushchev that you actually have a blurb on the back by Sergei Khrushchev, his son. Oh, uh, yes. So I'd like to know a little bit about that too. Um, I had the, um, I had great respect for Nikita Khrushchev and what he tried to do with that secret speech in February of 1956. He did something that was very brave. He did something that fought the political culture of his time for the right reason. And that at the very end he failed, I'm sorry about, obviously. But I, I, I like the idea that he made the effort. I like the idea that he was able to speak to a young American about basketball <laughs> as a symbol of his vision at that time of Russia's greatness. I mean, Russian, Russian basketball, believe me, was so ordinary. I mean, we could have killed them in basketball. Well, but the Lithuanian team was... The perfect. Lithuanian team, Khrushchev <laughs> called the greatest team in the world. And as a City College graduate, City College won in 1950 the NCAA and the NIT tournaments they were terrific. They would, have, they would have destroyed that Lithuanian team. But how do I say that to Nikita Khrushchev? You know, without, I did sort of suggest that maybe an American team on a good night, when the Russian team had a bad night, maybe we could win. And he gave me a fierce look there for a moment. I thought we were heading into World War III. Um, but Khrushchev was a real character. And I, I ask you to take a look on your fancy modern gadgets and go back to 1961, the United Nations, September 1961, and you'll see a photograph of Nikita Khrushchev in the Soviet seat, taking off his shoe and pounding it on the table. No sensible international leader would ever do that. It was disrespectful, but he did it. You got one that might do that. <laughs> no. 
Okay, uh, actually, I'm gonna, I promise this gentleman, and then I want to come back to Alma for a final question. Marvin, you, yes. have, you have been around, you have seen many power, powerful people, you have traveled to the Middle East. Speak Europe. into the microphone. My question to you, who is the person or persons that you respect the most? The person I respect the most? My father. Um, but put the family aside for a second. Um, <laughs> she comes close. Um, it's hard. You know, in a funny kind of way, I had enormous regard for Lyndon Johnson. And the reason I did was that he, like Khrushchev, was he took on the racism in this country. He took it on in a way that ended up with the Democratic Party losing the South and reorganizing the entire political system in the United States. But Lyndon Johnson, more than any other politician, made it possible for there to be a Voting Rights Act and a Civil Rights Act in 1964 and 1965 in this country. And to me, that still stands as one of, a, a monument of political courage. And we don't see that kind of thing in our politics today. Uh, the Republican Party today is a, is a spineless, fearful group of old men, even in their 50s, um, who won't do anything that is sensible at all because they're terrified. And um, Linda Johnson, if I had to, and there, are, there have been others, obviously, but he sticks in my mind as being a courageous politician. And, and the war in Vietnam, of course, destroyed him. It, the war destroyed Linda Johnson. His great society, which was doing really great things in this country, fell, it didn't fall apart, but was damaged by the war. He couldn't manage the war. And on March, it'll be coming up on an anniversary day very soon, on March 31st, 1968, Linda Johnson surprised everybody by getting on television and doing two things. One, saying that he's going to reach out and try to get an agreement with North Vietnam and end the war in Vietnam. And two, that he's not going to run again for president. Big deal. It was, it was quite a story. <laughs> All right. And I think it's only appropriate, Alma, you have the last question. And then... I remind you all that we have, as usual, books for sale. You're going to enjoy it. Thank you very much, Marvin. This was fascinating. <clears throat> Just as an end note, you have, I understand your admiration for Lyndon Johnson completely. Let's get back to Khrushchev for a minute. He makes his secret speech in February of 56, and then by October of 56, he made, he had two decisions that he could have made, and he decided to suppress what was going on in Eastern Europe, thereby giving it until 1989 when the Warsaw Pact countries fell, an opportunity to have an entire Eastern Europe just dying from his repression. Uh, that he created. How do you explain that and still feel that he was a great figure? Um, I, I will try, but I'll do it poorly. Um, I have found over the years that, that politicians um, make large decisions for different reasons at different times in their careers that certain decisions made at one time could not be made three or four years later. Nikita Khrushchev, for example, was a great hero in Russia and in large parts of the world for a chunk of 1956. But then at the end, when he had to make his decision on Hungary, he became a bad guy, symptomatic of the worst of Kremlin power. 
Um, but he had the guts at that moment to make the right call. And he blew it. And he blew it for reasons that have to do with other requirements of politics. And politics is a complicated, multi, I have to tell you, multi-layered endeavor. And, and there isn't anyone whom I have ever met in the world of politics who was pure, who is absolutely wonderful at all times. You can't say that about John Kennedy. You cannot say that about Trump. You cannot say that about Nixon. Nixon walks around and will forever, I think, as an evil guy. But Nixon did incredibly positive things domestically in this country. Really wonderful things, environmental things, things we live by today, things that are today being crushed by another Republican president. But Nixon did do Watergate. He, he did lie. He lied constantly. But, and this is an interesting factor, a lie when Nixon did it could cause him almost certain impeachment. A lie today has become the norm. We live with lies all the time. It yet could become a cause for impeachment. It is possible that somebody like Mueller will find a system of lies that lead to illegality, and that will be, that will be the key issue, in my judgment. We're going to have, and we do every day, exciting moments, and Mueller is doing this, and Trump. But at the end of the day, it's not the lying that got Nixon. In this case, we've elevated the discussion so that lying is accepted. Now you have to have illegality. And if that be proven, uh, then our president's going to be in, in desperate trouble. But it's a wonderful question, and it really gets to the heart of what politics is all about. And we could go back and, uh, to Plato and, and find those same dilemmas described in Greece as, as take place now with our president today. It's the same um, mix of psychology and power. Well, I think those notes are very appropriate ones at an Aspen Institute program. Um, we actually still talk about Plato in many, in many Aspen programs. This has been a privilege and a wonderful conversation, and I thank all of you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.